Hello, hello everybody on YouTube land. How's everybody doing? Today I'm going to be talking about a subject that affects everyone. There have been hundreds if not thousands of teachings on this particular subject, but the majority of them are wrong because an exegesis teaching was not given. Only part of the picture was looked at and not the whole picture. I'm not going to sit here and act like I <clears throat> have it completely right on this subject. But unlike Christian, Christian pastors, I'm going to look at the whole picture, not just part of it. The video series is about everlasting life. Most of the scriptures we're going to read are Yahshua Messiah's thoughts on everlasting life. First, let me tackle the subject of going to heaven and hell, since we're talking about everlasting life. When a person is given a teaching on everlasting life, they usually ask the question, When you die, are you going to heaven or hell? I'm probably going to be preaching to the choir on this one, but this is not common knowledge to everybody, so bear with me for anybody out there that knows about this already. Is the hell taught in the church the same as in Scripture? The Hebrew word for hell is Sheol. That comes from H7592, Hades, or the world of the dead, as if a subtraining retreat, grave, hell, pit. This definition has no reference to everlasting punishment that's usually taught when hell is taught. One of the words for hell in Greek is Gehenna. That comes from G1067. Thayers defines it as Hell is the place of the future punishment called Gehenna, or Gehenna Fire. This was originally the valley of Hinnom, south of Jerusalem, where the filth and dead animals of the city were cast out and burned, a fit symbol of the wicked and their future destruction. Another word for in the Greek for hell is Hades, that's G86. Properly unseen that is Hades, or the place or state of of departed souls, grave, hell. So this definition sounds a lot like the Hebrew definition, Sheol, for hell. Gehenna is used 12 times in New Testament. Hades is used 11 times in the New Testament. Why were there two different definitions for the word hell in the New Testament? Maybe the writers of the scriptures had a better understanding of what hell is than we do. So if someone tells you that you're going to hell, you can just smile and say, I know, thanks. So what about going to heaven? Psalms 37, 28, and 29 say, For Yahweh loves right ruling and does not forsake his kind ones. They shall be guarded forever, but the seed of the wrongdoers is cut off. The righteous shall inherit the earth and dwell in it forever. Isaiah 60, verse 21, And your people, all of them righteous, shall inherit the earth forever a branch of my planting, a work of my hands to be adorned. And the Messiah said in Matthew 5, 5, Blessed are the meek because they shall inherit the earth. Looks like these three verses are saying that heaven is coming to earth. Heaven is coming to us. That contradicts the thought that when a believer dies, they leave earth and go to heaven. Now that we got heaven and hell out the way, let's do like Nacho Libre and get down to the nitty gritty. The most well known verse about everlasting life is, of course, what? John 3.16. I'm going to start reading in verse 13 in John and read 2 verse 16. And no one has gone up into the heaven except he who came down from the heaven, the son of Adam. Here's another verse about. Nobody is going to heaven. There's another verse to add to the mix. Verse 14. And as Moshe lifted up the servant in the wilderness, even so the son of Adam has to be lifted up, so that whoever is believing in him should not perish but possess everlasting life. For Elohim so loved the world that he gave his only brought forth son, so that everyone who believes in him should not perish but possess everlasting life. We all know this verse very well. We've all heard it quite often, being raised in the church. But is that all we have to do to is believe to have everlasting life? 
say some more of them size words in Matthew 19, 16 through 22. And see, one came and said, said to him, Good teacher, what good shall I do to have everlasting life? And he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except one, Elohim. But if you wish to enter into life, guard the commands. He said to him, Which? And Yahshua said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. Respect your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. These are all commands taught in the Torah. Verse 20. The young man said to him, All these I have watched over from my youth. What do I still lack? Yahshua said to him, If you wish to be perfect, go sell what you have and give it to the poor. You shall have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. And when the young man heard the word, he went away sad because he had many possessions. Let me read verse 17 one more time. And he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except Elohim. But if you wish to enter into life, guard the commands. Why is this verse so over overlooked when a teaching about everlasting life is given? Yahshua clearly says that you have to guard the commands of Yahweh in his Torah to have everlasting life. There's no way there's no way you can get around that. Revelations twelve seventeen. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to fight with the remnant of her seed, those guarding the commands of Elohim and possessing the witness of Yahshua Messiah. A couple chapters later in verse in fourteen twelve in Revelations. Here's the endurance of the set apart ones. Here are those guarding the commands of Elohim and the belief of Yahshua. We see from these two verses in Revelations that the believers in the latter days have belief in Yahshua and they are obedient to the Yahweh's commands. Also, faith plus obedience equals everlasting life, not just faith alone. James 2:14 through 26. My brothers, what use is it for anyone to say he has belief, but does not have works? This belief is unable to save him. And if a brother or sister is naked in need of daily f need, daily food, but one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed, and be filled. But you do not give them the bodily needs. What use is it? So as so also belief, if it is if it is does not have works is in itself dead but someone might say you have belief and I have works show me your belief without your works and I show you my, my belief by my works belief is an action word it's a verb you believe the Elohim is one you do well the demons also believe and shudder but do you wish to know O foolish man that Belief without works is dead. Was not Abraham our father declared right by works when he offered Yitzhak, his son, on the altar? Do you see that the belief was working with his works? And by the works, the belief was perfected. And the scripture was filled which says, Abraham believed Elohim and he was reckoned to him for righteousness and he was called Elohim's friend. You see then that a man is declared right by works and not by belief alone. In the same way, was not Rahab, the whore, also declared right by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so also the belief is dead without the works. Yahweh wants more than belief from his people. Belief is important, but it does not fulfill all the requirements of salvation. Yahweh wants a people with a heart to serve Him, a people desirous to follow Yahshua's example. It's clear from reading the Torah that honoring Torah is choosing life. We go to Deuteronomy 30, verses 10 through 20. If, now that's a big two letter word right there, if. If you obey the voice of Yahweh, your Elohim, to guard his commands and his laws, which are written in the book of the Torah. If you turn back to Yahweh, your Elohim, with all your heart and with all your being, 
For this command which I am commanding you today, it is not too hard for you, nor is it far off. It is in, not in the heavens to say, Who shall ascend into the heavens for us, and bring it to us, and cause us to hear it, so that we do it? Nor is it beyond the sea to say, Who shall go over the sea for us, and bring it to us, and cause us to hear it, so that we do it? For the word is very near you, in your mouth and in your heart, to do it. See, I have set before you today life and good, and death and evil. In that I am commanding you to today to love Yahweh your Elohim, to walk in his ways and to guard his commands and his laws and his right rulings, and you shall live and increase, and Yahweh your Elohim shall bless you in the land which you go to possess. But if your heart turns away and you do not obey and shall be drawn away and shall bow down to other mighty ones and serve them, I have declared to you today that you shall certainly perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you are passing over the Arden to enter and possess. I have called the heavens and the earth as witnesses today against you. I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. Therefore you shall choose life so that you live, both you and your seed, to love Yahweh your Elohim, to obey his voice, and to cling to him, for he is your life, and the length of your days to dwell in the land which Yahweh swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Yitzhak, to Jacob, to give them. Yahweh gives us life when we make a conscious choice to obey Him and His Torah. We have the choice to obey or not to obey. Yahweh gives us free will. Serving Yahweh is all about the heart. You can see from Genesis all the way to Revelations, Israel obeyed for a season and worshiped other mighty ones. Served Yahweh, worshiped other mighty ones, back and forth, back and forth. Then they came back to Yahweh for another season, back to their disobedience. Is that a heart after Yahweh? No. To truly be a servant of Yahweh, you have to have a heart to serve Him and walk in His ways. Matthew 19, verse 23 through 29. And Yahshua said to His taught ones, Truly I say to you, that it is hard for a rich man to enter into the reign of the heavens. And again I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the reign of Elohim. And when his taught ones heard it, they were very astonished, saying, Who then is able to be saved? And looking intently, Yahshua said to them, With men this is impossible, with Elohim all is possible. Then Kepha answering said to him, See, we have left all and followed you. What then shall we have? And Yahshua said to them, Truly I say to you, when the son of Adam sits on the throne of his esteem, you who have followed me in the rebirth, shall also sit on the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Yisrael. And everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. Our relationship with Yahweh is more important than any other relationship we have in our life, period. A lot of our family members think we're in a cult, or we're brainwashed, Anyways, by the way we live, our relationship with Yahweh is more important, or should be more important than any other relationship we have in our life, whether it's brother, sister, co-worker, boyfriend, girlfriend, wife, husband, whatever. When we stand in front of Yahweh on Judgment Day, we're going to be standing by ourselves, not with our family members or anybody else. Shalom.